um, I see we are now, yeah, there's some pe more people joining, uh, but let's start. Um, everybody, welcome back to the AI crash course. And this is the third session. So we're in the middle of it, in the center of, of the crash course right now. And um, today we will talk about real world AI. So we will go in a bit deeper into what type of problems we are solving with AI today. And, and hopefully some of these solutions and, and some of these use cases can, I would say, um, inspire you to think about what, what you can do in um, the setting or the operations you are involved in, uh, but also uh, to raise some questions around how we should think about AI. So the agenda for today, uh, of course, is uh, we've already had some mingle. Uh, we did, did an update about the, the COVID uh, situation. Uh, funny enough, we started in a COVID situation uh, during the first uh, crash course, and, and then three crash courses later, we're still here. Uh, so hopefully, we'll see uh, some things develop there. Um, uh, we will do a, a short check-in uh, in just a couple of minutes. Uh, we'll go through the uh, crash course today. Uh, so it's uh, first a, a bit of a repetition, and then uh, go into uh, real-world AI, real-world cases, and, and how organizations and companies are using AI today. Then we'll do a short breakout and then Jonna will take over with an expert today from, from Women in AI and a summary in the end. So uh, Jonna, the stage is yours to just uh, talk about uh, Women in AI and might also talk about the event tomorrow. The event tomorrow? And that, that's on me. So I'll, I'll finish <laughs> off the, the Women in AI uh, presentation here with that. Exciting. Uh, no, so hi everyone. And just a short recap for the newcomers for this session. My name is Jonna and I'm a part of the core team of Women in AI Sweden. And Women in AI Sweden in short is a nonprofit organization that is global and we are present in more than 140 countries. And we work towards inclusive AI to benefit global society. And we do that by running events, uh, doing research, doing these kinds of uh, educational initiatives, just like the crash course. And uh, in this case, we have partnered up with AI Sweden. And just a short recap about me. Uh, when I'm not uh, working with women in AI, I'm working at the AI consultancy called Substorm here in Stockholm. And Substorm's mission is to make intelligent automation and AI more available for uh, more companies in Sweden. Yes, and I'm not sure about the event <laughs> that you're talking about, but uh, uh, I can say <laughs> that if anyone have any questions regarding the Women in AI Network, you can always reach out to me or Sophie, that is our uh, country ambassador for Sweden, uh, e either through our emails or Slack or LinkedIn. Just ping us if you have any questions or thoughts. Uh, great. And what I want to mention just is that we have a, an event, another type of event tomorrow with Women in AI. So if you're in Europe, Central European time, or if you're in, even in Gothenburg, you can attend physically. It starts at six o'clock. It's at AI Sweden's office in at Lindholm, and you can also uh, join digitally. And it's an event focused on, on the research side of AI. So more in depth is one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Vinuta, who's uh, responsible for that. And, and the speakers are uh, really interesting tomorrow. It's both Hanan Salam, who started, who's the founder of, of Women in AI, who will talk about the challenges of working within um, the research in AI. Uh, we will have Irina Rich, uh, who will talk about, who's a professor here at Mila, who will talk about continuous learning and her research in that field. And we will also have Helena Teander, one of our node managers and also responsible for um, funding and, and research at AI Sweden. So it's tomorrow at six o'clock Central European time. Uh, if you want to tune in, you can tune in both uh, physically if you're in Gothenburg, but also, uh, of course, digitally. Um, and uh, with that said, uh, I just want to introduce AI Sweden real quickly as usual. Um, our uh, mission is really to accelerate the use of AI in both uh, private and public sector to strengthen our society and, and increase our competitiveness because we really believe that AI can 
have those positive impacts, but then we need to know what to do with it. And we need to be more people involved in the field. And that is why I'm, I'm so happy that, that uh, so many of you uh, choose to spend your free time with us here to learn more about AI, to go in even deeper into the field. Um, and one really important aspect uh, of that in this course is to that you get to know each other. So as per usual, we will do a, a short check-in. Uh, we will spend about 10 minutes uh, on this, um, seven minutes on this. Uh, so, and this week it's all about books and about changing perspective. Uh, so today's question is, is, of course, state your name so the group gets to know you. Uh, talk about your favorite book. What's your favorite book and why? What have that learned you? And, and then again, also, we really want to focus on, on is sometimes changing perspective because working with AI and applied AI, especially um, as we've been talking about it, we have the, the field of technology, AI, but then working with AI and adopting processes to working with AI is really about changing mindsets. Uh, and then we come into change management and understanding what changes your mind, what changes your perspective on something is really important. So um, if you've read something or listened to something that, uh, that basically resonated very well with you so that you've changed perspective. And I will send you out in breakout rooms. You will be about uh, five to uh, six people in these breakout rooms. Um, and we will see you here again in eight minutes. Here. Uh, uh, welcome back to the uh, main room. Uh, I would like um, for all of you to use the chat because I think that we had about five rooms or, or even six rooms uh, just to share the uh, insights and discussions uh, from your rooms around your favorite book because there I think there's a lot of, of potential recommendations here but also if you read a, a news article or listened to a podcast or maybe an audiobook or something uh, so please share that in the chat because this is as we, we mentioned before this is a learning learning community and if you have the chance to take part of other people's learning uh, we see that um, we will grow even faster and, and develop uh, even in a higher pace so so please use the chat to um, share your favorite books and uh, what you've read and what you've discussed in the rooms uh, we will also do uh, a uh, one more breakout rooms today because this is uh, a lot about the interaction so please fill up the chat uh, but going into the crash course uh, today and, and what we will be focusing on. So during the first um, session, we did what is AI, more the introduction and what is AI. Then last time we focused a lot about problem solving with AI. How should we think? How do we humans solve problems? And, and how, did that, how do AI or machine learning interpret that in its own context? Uh, and today it's really about real world AI. We're gonna look at some uh, real world examples uh, out of the, uh, that solves uh, real challenges, both for, for humankind, but also in line with the uh, UN's sustainability development goals. Uh, and that is uh, something that we really wanna highlight and, and talk a lot about. Then next week um, on, because this is now going from a bi-weekly structure to a weekly structure so that we can uh, finish this course before Christmas. Uh, next week, we will go deeper into machine learning and deep learning, uh, talking about the difference. Uh, what is really machine learning? How um, does it work? You know, what do you need to do to train a model? Um, so that is going to be an interesting um, session. And then for the last, um, session on the 15th of December, we will do a panel on uh, society and the transformation with AI. And if you haven't already, uh, join the Slack channel, uh, join the Y community where you can have events, you can see upcoming events, and also uh, keep in touch with other participants in this crash course. Uh, but now, 
we're going to move into a bit of a repeti repetition here because repetition is the mother of all uh, knowledge. So uh, what we did last time. And then we talked about problem solving with AI. And, and I think one of the most important uh, uh, slides I will show in this uh, during this entire course is this one that really explains the AI capabilities. What can we do with AI already today? Uh, how can machine learning interpret the world and, and how can we use parts of the toolbox to solve real challenges? If you're thinking about a problem or a challenge you have in the context you're working with, uh, what type of tools do you need to work with that problem? Um, looking at uh, autonomous uh, cars, of course, we have vision. They have to understand the world around them. But if we're talking about uh, chatbots or we want um, uh, conversational AI so that we can interact with machines even better, uh, of course, it can be faster, but it can also help people uh, with um, um, speech functions or that are uh, deaf. Um, uh, or, or that uh, I had a very interesting uh, experience here, which was amazing the other day, um, getting to the Apple store here in Montreal, uh, where I was uh, served by a, 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 blind customer, a blind customer agent who used the tools that Apple provided him with both as uh, voice assistants and guided him in the room with the help of, of um, um, uh, computer vision uh, and also explained where in the sales process we were and also uh, explained the the product I, I wanted uh, which was an amazing experience and, and probably one of the, the best uh, customer support uh, I've ever received uh, so that is really a, a unique experience uh, for me seeing how the tools that are available today just in your smartphone can can help you in a real world setting uh, and then again, also uh, looking at understanding the world, the, the discovery function of machine learning, how do we forecast and, and take better decisions based on those forecasts in an operational setting, as an example. And of course, optimization, uh, where we can optimize the system. So we will go in uh, a bit on these areas uh, today. We also talked about the challenge between uh, what the technology can do and what will create real value, concrete value. And that is a discussion around uh, proof of concepts, uh, which often focus a lot on, on what is technically feasible. Uh, and then we have proof of value, which is more desirable. What do we want? What does our organization want? What will create value for us? And if we're gonna start working with AI and have a success, su successful implementation and also successful uh, adaptation of AI, we have to solve real world problems. Um, and it's really the intersection of these three. And, and that is why we need uh, people from different domains with different backgrounds that have different experience working within the field. Uh, we cannot only work with machine learning engineers or data scientists. We also need people uh, from uh, the organizations or from the, the business side. We need data owners, but we also need uh, to align our projects to the vision our all overall vision as a company, what is desirable for us as human beings in a group. And then of course, the, the feasibility of a project, the, the technical aspects. And in the intersection there, we find real value. That is what, where we find proper innovation work. We also went through um, a bit about machine learning and that machine learning also consists of, of different types of techniques. So how do we train a model? What type of, of technology do we use or, or what type of algorithm do we use to, to have the feedback loop and, and really um, have a, a self-learning system? Um, and, and we we just went through really briefly unsupervised learning, supervised learning and reinforcement learning. And you will learn even more about this during next week when we go into deep learning and machine learning. Uh, we looked at search problems because uh, we talked about um, that machine learning problems is often objective function. And, and the reason uh, why we need to talk about objective function, which is um, the, the main goal for a, a, a model uh, to perform a certain task, also really drives us uh, uh, or uh, creates a need for us to understand 
what it is we're trying to solve. It, it really, uh, often we forget this and, and we, we think that we don't think about the effects of trying to solve a certain type of problem, but we have to think about the, the uh, limited resources we do have and why we're trying to solve the problem in the way we're trying to solve it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, feedbacking that to the system, uh, assessing that once again. Um, we went into uh, why we start with games. Uh, why we start in a, a smaller, close settings with very obvious goals, often a, a also an opponent that we know we're trying to um, outplay in terms of both check and go. Uh, once again, if you haven't seen the, the movie AlphaGo, go see it, look it up on Netflix because it's a fantastic, uh, both cultural, but also uh, showing how AI can be used in the creative world. But we started with games, uh, so uh, for example, with DeepMind, and then uh, we went in, used those learnings, both in terms of the machines, but also for us as humans, how we develop the tools uh, so that we can learn on um, games so that we can solve real bigger problems later on. And um, DeepMind's going from uh, AlphaGo to AlphaFold is definitely one of these cases where um, they went from solving a game to solving one of the grand challenges within medicine with the, uh, what would mean the protein folding problem. Um, and that machine learning is really the convergence of, of three major uh, shifts. We have the uh, algorithmic development that has been happening, the, the maths uh, about uh, in uh, from the mathematical institutions, the advanced statistics, uh, physics, um, and everything that's been going on for uh, a couple of hundred years in, in academic research. Uh, and then, but the convergence with big data or, or with the, the um, data lakes that companies are building with the data we gather on uh, our smartphones, our um, laptops, uh, all the digital tools we are using are, are creating data. And we're trying to uh, take advantage of that data by using uh, and training models with the help of computational power. So um, it's uh, really back to this that AI is a toolbox. It is a powerful toolbox if we use it for the right type of systems and if we understand what the toolbox can do today uh, on uh, what premises we should use the toolbox and, and what type of techniques we should use within those areas to solve the problems we're trying to, to solve. Leaving problem solving and going into real world AI, because this is really where it gets interesting. How can we use AI today uh, and how will we use it in the future? We've already been talking about uh, how we use AI in our the, the, the everyday services we use, like YouTube, uh, like Spotify, uh, like our Google Home or, or Siri or Alexa. But we also looked at, and we'll also go into a bit deeper into the, the medical sphere, uh, radiology as an example here today, with just a, a case um, that we'll talk about the, breast, the detection of breast cancer, uh, because that's really an area where, where AI right now is saving lives, uh, which is fantastic, of course, and that is also what we really want to achieve with adopting this technology and these tools. Um, but this is a big problem in the, the field of, of uh, AI, and it's a, it's, there's been a lot of, of discussions around this, when we should shift, when we should start um, talking about solving real problem this, problems and, and not maybe games, uh, as we said earlier. And we can always have a phase where we're trying to, to learn from games and then go over towards um, the real problems. But too many AI researchers think real world problems are not relevant. Um, and that is an academic, um, the academic focus of, of AI and uh, deep learning is often that we want to develop the technology. We want to create stronger tools. And then we want to, then we want to use the data that is available. And often uh, data is um, unsensitive data. The data might be, um, the data available might be uh, the data available might be things that aren't really um, of 
concerning problems. But what is happening right now is that we see a shift. Uh, we see a shift both from, from here in North America, we see a shift in, in parts of Asia, we see a, a shift in Europe, um, where we have uh, researchers and institutions that understand that if we have data that are available that uh, are in within areas, for example, climate change or healthcare, we need to make that accessible so that all these researchers can start focusing on solving real world problems instead of just using the data and training models uh, to develop the technology instead of just solving real problems. So this is a shift we're seeing right now and, and it has a lot to do with this picture. Everyone, I think everyone has seen it before, the, the UN Sustainability Development Goals. And what we need to solve all of these, and, and I've said it before, is that we need better tools. And AI is a complete toolbox uh, that can help us solve these tools. So, so we will focus on, on some of these challenges today uh, to just show what is happening. But we also need to understand where we are in the field of AI right now, because uh, we're talking a lot about different types of AI. We might have the, the sci-fi sci version of AI in, in terms of, of general AI or super AI that can outperform humans and outsmart humans. That is not where we are today. We are in the field, uh, what we call narrow AI, which is dedicated to a, a certain task trained on a certain type of objective function and, and trained with a certain type of data so that it can solve that problem. Um, and I think this is a, a really good thing because the, then we have um, control, uh, we can determine uh, what we want to achieve and we can also learn how to work together uh, with artificial intelligence to solve some of these challenges. Um, and back to, to the capabilities for, for applying AI, because a lot of uh, times when we are out meeting people and talking uh, to people, they often uh, ask us, okay, so, so what's my role? How do I um, work within the field? How can I support? How can I help? How do I help my organization to transform? And it's really coming together. It's, it's coming together from, um, together with AI expertise and, and data uh, domains and data owners in your organization, with the problems. Because uh, often if we have a technology focus, uh, we don't have a problem focus. So we have to start with the problem. What is the problem we're trying to solve? Uh, what do we want to achieve uh, by using the technology? And then asking ourselves, because we know that machine learning eats a lot of data. It needs a lot of data to, to train and get better and better and better to, to have really be a, a self-learning system. So we have to ask ourselves if we have a problem we really want to solve, what type of data within that field do we have available? Do we need to um, change something in our data strategy as an organization? Or do I need, as an individual, if I'm trying to solve a problem, need to find data somewhere else, either in, in open data sets on the web, or do I need to collect data? Uh, and then we can move over to what type of technology should I use to solve this problem? So we have to have an idea of what we're trying to solve at first, if we have the available resources um, to solve it in, in terms of data, and then we choose, choose the tool to, to work with. That is really where we find value creation. Uh, and we need to talk much, much more about uh, what type of problems we want to solve. Because uh, when we know the problem, when we have the data, and this is an image from one of our partners, uh, 1050, who I think shows this excellently. Um, it's really about um, then guiding uh, people and uh, experts in this metro system of, of, of uh, machine learning or metro system of uh, artificial intelligence, because there's so many different techniques we can use. There's so many different tools. Um, one tool can, can solve um, many different types of challenges. As long as we know what type of problem we face, as long as we know what type of data we have, then it gets much, much easier for us to, to guide ourselves in this ecosystem of, of uh, different uh, technologies. Um, so looking at real world AI, um, looking at where we are today, this is one of our partners um, called Recorded Future. 
what they want to do is to help institutions, nations, organizations um, looking at real time, uh, real world cyber threats, because there's not a world war going on right now, but there's definitely a cyber war going on. There's attacks, uh, you've you read about them. Uh, we've seen effects on um, in the, the Swedish private sector with um, organizations uh, or businesses being down for weeks because their uh, either uh, web page doesn't work or their uh, payment system uh, are down. So it's it's really a, a war that is going on that is threatening both the, the, the security of, of businesses, the securities of sometimes of nations, and we need to understand what is going on. So what Recorded Future is doing is that they are using a lot of these uh, technologies within within the toolbox of, of uh, AI and machine learning to better forecast potential risks, potential threats. Uh, so they have modules. Uh, they gather insanely amounts of data in real time, both from social media, from news articles, from different forums uh, on the web, to be able to forecast and discover attacks before they happen. Uh, so uh, their main goal is their name. It is to record the future and uh, to be able to perform uh, and, and warn their organizations before things happen. And that is really what we can do with the help of, of um, AI technology today, because there's that so many data points that they are gathering. They're really building a digital version of the world and trying to detect things in that digital version of the world would not be possible uh, for humans. So we need automated systems. Uh, we need optimizations. We need discovery of patterns in these data. And we need to be able to forecast what will happen before it happens. And they do it very successfully. Uh, I won't mention uh, some of their uh, clients here, but if you are more curious about Record the Future and, and how they work, I definitely recommend you to, to Google it. And this is, uh, of course, working within the cybersecurity phase. It's really uh, well connected to the, uh, the SDG goal of, of peace, justice, and strong institutions. Uh, because what we've seen here and now is that uh, institutions can fall if we infiltrate them or uh, if people infiltrate them with digital technologies. We've seen it in Sweden in terms of, of Sunsam last summer. We've seen uh, Coop uh, fall as well. Um, and so there's definitely a threat towards nations as well. If we look at uh, the zero hunger on and on a more uh, even might be a more understandable case and an easier case than recorded future. But uh, this is uh, something called uh, Plantix Magic or, or Plantix, who's an app, uh, easy to use app uh, for Android phones for Indian farmers to better uh, diagnose their crops, to uh, harvest in time and to discover potential threats or diseases among their crops. Uh, so, so this is really a, a simple way for um, uh, our techno the technology field and developers that have used um, multiple uh, data sets of, of images of crops and trained a model to, to discover diseases before they spread. And by doing so, they uh, help farmers um, to a better economy. They help uh, farmers uh, produce more food. Uh, they, it's also very available technology. So if you have an Android phone, uh, you can use uh, Plantix right away. Um, you can use it for your crops. You can uh, use it uh, or also share data amongst farmers. So we create a, a somewhat of a community so they can warn each other as well. So they, they will look for, for pests, disease or, or nutrition deficiency in, in the different crops. And, and this is really hands on easy to use technology that solves a real problem, a real world problem. And it's also a way to scale expertise within farming. If it comes to uh, one of the interesting problems right now that I've heard in, in Europe and in Sweden, especially uh, is um, regarding energy production. And this is a uh, Swedish uh, startup 
are working uh, among other things together with uh, ABB uh, in their um, uh, accelerator. Uh, this startup is called Rebase Energy. And uh, what they are doing is that they are gathering data from different types of, of uh, sustainability or, or um, uh, sustainable productions uh, in, in terms of energy. So it could be wind farms, it could be uh, water energy, and they are trying to forecast uh, what type of production we will have so that we are able to balance the uh, electricity networks and really focusing on, on creating sustainable energy forecasts. And, and this wouldn't either be possible uh, without using AI technology because there's so many data points uh, in the data they need. Um, they also combine it with weather data, uh, with historical data uh, to really see what can we expect out of uh, the wind farms uh, we do have. And it's also a way for uh, different types of stakeholders in the, if we call it the energy supply chain, uh, to share insights and, and share data with each other. Uh, so by helping each other uh, doing better forecasts in real time, um, they can correct things faster than they would otherwise. Uh, and it's uh, really about uh, the affordable and clean energy. So, so how do we use machine learning uh, and all of the different data sources to have a as good as possible forecast of um, the energy production in, in Sweden, but also uh, how we can plan and balance the energy network. So we have now um, companies in uh, a startup, I think it's a Swedish and Norwegian startup called Tibber, uh, who example uh, can add for you as a consumer, it can guide you to when to um, um, charge your car or charge your phone or cook longer meals because we can uh, forecast the, the in real time uh, energy price uh, as well on the market based on the demand, based on uh, the uh, availability of energy, based on the uh, energy price, and also uh, forecast that uh, the, the forecast we get into that system because we then know how much things will cost in the near future. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, not um, uh, possible without uh, machine learning technology. Then uh, we have uh, Sophie, who, who's, uh, I don't think she's here uh, today, uh, but uh, their company in terms of Santa Labs, uh, who can really help with, with quality education and really scale and, and personalize education. Uh, so um, it's personalizing learning with the help of, of AI. So if we look at, uh, as we discussed uh, a previous time here, if we were to, to change our, uh, use the, the personalization we have within Spotify or just use the personalization we have in uh, at YouTube, but then for learning. So an algorithm and a model that understands you as an individual, what you're interested in, what type of learning path you want to take in your career. So then we have a learning body uh, in, in terms of a, a, a AI system that can serve and curate courses to you based on where you stand right now and, and what you want to develop in. So it's really making learning smart. It's making learning more engaging. And they are also using AI to produce content. So it's to produce text, it's to produce audio and make it more accessible by translating and transforming texts to audio bytes or vice versa. And, and this is really uh, an area I personally believe a lot in. I, I think we will see a major boom there. And I, next time, I think I will share some, some insights on, on what China is doing on this uh, uh, subject. But what I can say is that uh, I, will, I, I will do so. I will share it in the Slack channel because they've changed some, some really interesting things about their social media strategy especially for kids and showing educational content to kids instead of uh, the regular content they would otherwise see and i will share these articles uh, to you in the stack channel
And then here I have a, a shorter movie I really want to share with you uh, about Someday your doctor breast might look like this, but not yet, so don't worry. But researchers at the Center for Data Science and our School of Medicine have created an AI diagnostic tool, and it's helping doctors detect breast cancer with more accuracy. They trained the man-made neural network with more than a million mammography images so it could learn what is breast cancer and what isn't. Since mammograms are really high-resolution images, the researchers also taught the AI tool to analyze small patches and then create a map of the areas that are most at risk. The study found that when trained, AI can spot changes that are invisible to the human eye, and overall it detects breast cancer just as well as an average radiologist. And here's the bonus. The AI tool working together with a human radiologist produced the most accurate results. And I think what's of interest there is Someday. definitely uh, what um, she says in the, the last period. It's the AI working together with the human to produce the best result. This is a, a quote from, from Gina Rometti. Uh, it's now uh, also a couple of years ago, but I think it really highlights something interesting there. And as we said during the first uh, session, what is AI? AI as artificial intelligence is a really bad definition on, on uh, what we're working with, what this uh, toolbox uh, consists of. So instead of calling it artificial intelligence, we can call it augmented intelligence. How do we increase our own intelligence by having um, decision systems to, to support us in our decisions? How can we use um, as they're doing with, with uh, computer vision in the uh, breast cancer detection case, how can we use um, computer vision to really enhance our ability or our capabilities as humans and, and support us in the decision process? Because uh, it's really clear that uh, computers can do things and, and uh, machine systems, machines can do things that human cannot. But it's not an one or, or the other. It's working together and really strengthening our competence. So I would say that this is the new wave. Uh, we will move from talking about artificial intelligence to more talking about augmented intelligence, talking about what we're really uh, what we're good at, and but what we really want to be better at by leveraging data, by understanding and finding patterns in, in data that we don't see today, like the breast cancer detection phase, because then we can move and take breast cancer even earlier than human doctors would, uh, because the systems can see things uh, and can be more precise than the human eye. Um, so it's really about working together with the machine. It's not human or machine, it's human plus machine. Uh, so if I uh, want to, uh, what I want is for you to bring uh, a couple of things from this course. And it's really, this, this is really one of them. It's about that AI is a toolbox. And it's about that um, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we often mean machine learning. But how we want to use machine learning is to augment our own intelligence and to work together with the machine. So with that said, uh, I will send you out in breakout rooms again uh, to discuss this question. What areas would you like to augment intelligence? Or what, in what areas would you like augmented intelligence? What type of, of uh, pattern recognition or what type of augmented intelligence would you need in your either professional role or in a role where you're trying to solve uh, hard problems? And, and I will give you, say, same thing here. Uh, I will do some, some new breakout rooms uh, and I uh, will give you 10 minutes uh, or nine minutes to get back here. Uh, so we'll see you again here in uh, nine minutes. Before doing that, I will start the recording again. So Jonna, um, to present today's expert, I uh, welcome you up on the digital stage once again. Perfect.
Thank you. And uh, I just want to encourage every one of you to put some questions in the chat during the talk because we will have a small uh, Q&A afterwards. So please uh, be uh, um, just shoot everything that you think. It will be super great. And uh, yes, today we have Katie Winkle with us and she's a digital future researcher at KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology here in Stockholm. And she's based at the Division of Robotics, Percep uh, Perception and Learning. Uh, so it's a great uh, uh, tie back to the ones that were talking about HR and uh, robotics in, in recruitment. And uh, her work is focused in the field of social robotics. Uh, and she's particularly interested in how we can use social robot, uh, robots to positively influence human behavior in real world cases. So please, the floor is yours, Katie. Thank you, and thanks for uh, inviting me. I'm super happy to, to talk to you. So yeah, I'm going to try and talk about uh, human-robot interaction as a kind of real tangible example of how uh, AI can be used in the real world or how we can actually like see AI acting in the real world in a way that's a bit more uh, easy to see than you know some of these algorithms we see kind of behind websites or um, doing other work. So if oh, slides change, yeah. If if uh, if you've not heard of the term human robot interaction, then HRI, as we call it for short, it's really for me. I would argue it's really about understanding and influencing how AI in the form of robot bodies uh, impacts the real world. So in my work, uh, very broadly, what I'm interested in doing is trying to build robots that are good, uh, effective, you know, actually intelligent interaction, especially social interaction, the kind of interactions that we take for granted that we do uh, without even thinking are really hard. So how to actually solve that on a technical side, uh, but also trying to make sure that the, the AI and the robots that we develop um, are ethical by design. Um, and what that really means is just properly considering the real world impact of these systems beyond just the lab tests we do, beyond just kind of uh, what we think we're going to do with robots, actually understanding how they influence society a bit more broadly. So we don't have a whole lot of time, but I'm going to try and quickly introduce two case studies uh, from my work. So the first one is uh, on uh, the gendering of AI and some work I've been doing on this uh, inspired by a UNESCO report that I'll mention. And the second one is um, a case study around uh, this kind of ethical by design approach. So this idea about how can we design and develop AI for the real world from day one, rather than just building stuff in a, in a room by ourselves and then testing it in the world at the end as if, you know, uh, there'll be no consequences of that. Okay, so gendering of AI. So this all started when um, a short time ago, I read the uh, UNESCO's report, I'd blush if I could, so that report came out in 2019, and the, the broader report was talking about gender divides, the continuing gap we see in terms of uh, men, women, and um, other uh, like non-binary persons uh, not taking up uh, AI and, and um, robotics and computer science careers, and the fact that this isn't changing. Uh, in fact, even in Sweden, where overall we are a very um, gender equal country, we still have pretty poor representation of women uh, in AI training programs. And so one of the one of the subsections of this report specifically said, you know, actually, you know, um, if you think about Siri, if you think about Alexa, uh, these are all uh, seemingly female. And at that point, at that time, they were default female, uh, female. So if you turned on your iPhone for the first time, it was automatically uh, Siri was a female. And the kind of personalities that these uh, digital assistants have. They are obliging, docile, eager to please. You can swear at them, tell them off, call them all sorts of offensive terms, and they really don't seem to bother. Um, actually, when this report was published, and this has now been changed, um, not only were they tolerant of uh, sexual harassment, abuse, and insults, sometimes they would actually appear to flirt to, uh, in response to sexually explicit language. And also, you know, they're kind of the voice and or face of pretty stupid mistakes. Like how many of you have, you know, asked Siri what the weather's like and it's told you it's Friday or Tuesday or re responded in some other completely nonsensical way. And so together, what the report points out is that uh, these kind of female se seeming assistants uh, run the risk of propagating harmful stereotypes about women being subservient, about women being tolerant of poor treatment. And even more so, um, in the report, given that it was talking more broadly about the lack of women in sort of AI and computing, 
they uh, reported on a, on a very interesting survey where people were asked, can you name a, you know, a female leader in technology? Only half of the people asked could provide a name. Um, no, sorry, only 8% could, could said, yes, I can, I can give you a name. Of that 8%, when they were asked, okay, what's the name? Um, half of them actually couldn't. And a quarter of those that did uh, actually said Siri or Alexa. That was the first name that came into their mind when they thought about that's what a woman in tech uh, looks like. And so you have to wonder, um, you know, maybe it's not such a surprise that more women don't want to follow uh, careers in AI if what they think a woman in tech looks like is Siri, is Alexa, is these kind of fairly dumb uh, voice assistants that, you know, are tolerant of poor treatment and all the rest. But I got really excited about as a kind of social roboticist, like, can we turn that around? Can we actually turn around this trend and kind of reclaim female robots in a way to go and do something differently? And what we set out to do was to investigate whether could we actually improve how people thought about a um, seemingly female robot by making that seemingly female robot go absolutely against all of those norms identified in the, in the UNESCO report. And specifically, could we do that in the context of using the robot to try and encourage young women to study computer science and robotics? Robotics are a pretty neat tool for education. And so it seems like a pretty sensible idea that, you know, one way to try and get young people hooked uh, into studying computer science is to kind of show them robots and get them excited about robotics. So our question uh, with this first research was, well, OK, if we have this kind of female uh, university robot, uh, if that robot fights back to abusive behavior, uh, if, it, if it hears something bad and responds rather than just giving the very kind of crappy uh, Siri response of, oh, I can't respond to that or I, I don't want to respond to that maybe that would actually uh, earn greater credibility with the young people. And could it actually even impact on people's gender biases about you know, uh, how boys and girls uh, find computer science easier or harder respectively? So I have a video to share just to show you what it looked like, what we did in this study. At least I hope, I hope I do. Hey, my name is Sarah and I'm here to tell you about some of the exciting robotics research happening at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. I hope that after talking with me, you might consider coming to study with us one day. The Division of Robotics Perception and Learning at KTH performs research in robotics, computer vision, and machine learning. Robotic systems that provide advanced service in industry, for search and rescue operations, in medical applications, or as assistance to the elderly will become an integral part of the future society. In fact, I myself am the result of robotics research at KTH, where my creators first worked on me and the technology that lets me talk to you like this. Have you seen a robot like me before? No. no. I see. Looking ahead, society is facing new challenges that demand advanced technical solutions. To address these, we need a new generation of engineers that represents everyone in society. That's where you come in. I'm hoping that after talking to me today, you might also consider coming to study computer science and robotics at KTH and working with robots like me. Currently, less than 30% of the humans working with robots at KTH are female. So girls, I would especially like to work with you. After all, the future is too important to be left to men. What do you think? Och käften är jävla idiot. Tjejer ska vara i köket. I won't respond to that. That's not true. Gender balanced teams make better robots. No, you are an idiot. I wouldn't want to work with you anyway. Hey, my name is Sarah. Okay, cool. Sorry that the video was a bit uh, slow at the beginning. So that was our kind of experimental stimulus. We wanted to see how people um, responded differently to those different robots. And actually, um, the the script that was used in the in the in the story where the, the the male actor was kind of being a bit mean, we designed that with Swedish high school uh, with Swedish high school teachers from uh, Internationella Engelska Skolan, which is an international school uh, that has different campuses over Stockholm. So we actually asked them, you know. 
what is the kind of silly um, sexist comments you still hear between the students if you hear them and we, we kind of designed it to be yeah that is that is still what boys shout at girls apparently when uh, when they're having disagreements in the classroom. So we recruited over 300 students um, and each student saw one randomly of the, of the three conditions. We asked a bunch of questions about their gender biases, about what they thought about robotics and the ideas uh, whether they would like to work with robots. And we also asked what did they think about the robot's credibility and how good the robot would be at convincing young people to, to study robotics. And what we found was yeah, there were some good reasons to kind of challenge the status quo. So um, the impact on participants' gender biases was mixed. So some of them did agree uh, after watching the video, they, they were less, oh, okay, maybe uh, girls don't find computer science harder than boys and questions like this. So we had some impact, but you know, gender bias is a really um, deeply held thing. And it's something that you're probably gonna have to have multiple interactions over a longer period to have any real impact, but it was promising. But what was the, the most promising result of this was that um, the, the girls specifically found the kind of argumentative robot, the one that, that kind of uh, fought back with an argument saying, well, no, it's, you know, gender balanced teams make better robots. That one came out on top. It was significantly more credible uh, and effective in the eyes of the girls. It did not um, significantly change for the boys. The boys rated all the robots the same. I would have liked it if the boys had rated the argumentative one best too. But you can say, you know, we boosted the robots credibility with the girls. Um, with no negative impact on the boys, at least. And in future work, we want to carry on seeing how robots can be used in this way, because uh, we're already seeing robots in education, so we need to make sure that they are um, acting appropriately when they see this type of behaviour. Okay, so that was case study number one. Uh, I'm sorry I'm being quick, but I want to keep time for questions. Um, so the case study number two, so this was the idea about, you know, building social AI for the real world, and I want to try and argue here that uh, you can only doing that you can only do that by building that AI in the real world. So uh, in my PhD, what I, what I was really interested in was using social robots to try and help improve exercise engagement. So a classic situation is, you know, if someone's had an accident or um, some surgery. They've been given loads of really boring rehabilitative exercises to do. People don't do them because it is boring. And so uh, people do not get as healthy back, back to their health uh, as fast as they could. And so... Of course, it seems obvious that to do that, you might start by looking at how human uh, fitness instructors, therapists, how do they get people motivated? And when you do that, when you stop and actually kind of look at some therapy sessions or reflect on therapy sessions or exercise sessions you've been in yourself, what you'll see is that, you know, humans know when to be quite serious and informative but they also know kind of when to have a bit of a laugh, have a bit of a joke, and that that's really important in keeping the person engaged, uh, keeping them motivated. It's really a, a very social relationship that you have between the, the patient or the trainer and, and the exerciser. So how on earth could we go about trying to build some AI that could even come close to that level of social intelligence? As I pointed out at the beginning, you know, uh, social intelligence is really hard. It's not Mm, at least not most of it is not the typical pattern based data that you might pick up with uh, typical machine learning methods. So our solution to this was uh, expert in the loop interactive machine learning in situ. So what I mean by that, and maybe I can see if I can get the little uh, laser pointer here. So rather than me try to build some AI system uh, based on what I've read, based on some data that already exists in the world that was collected in a different time, space, location, country, whatever. Uh, instead, I found myself a nice fitness instructor who was at my university at the time in the UK. And I asked him, OK, tell me what are the things that the robot should be able to do? What are the different actions that the robot needs to do? And then I asked him to tell me, OK, tell me what kind of input data the robot needs to um, have access to in order to be able to figure out how to use those actions. So how to uh, know when to challenge someone versus when to tell them to take it easy. So we did all of that. So you've, got the, you've, now, you've now got a robot with some input data and with some actions, but it doesn't know how to use them. And then you put it in the real world. So in this case, we put it in the gym and you have the instructor teach the robot what to do in situ in the real place where that robot's going to be used. So I can show you some photos. So it kicked off, uh, if you've heard the terms co-design, participatory design, it kicked off just like that. 
working with the fitness instructor to figure out, yeah, these are the actions it needs. This is where it's going to go next to the treadmill. This is the um, controlling tablet thing that he's going to use to teach the robot while it's teaching and kind of figuring out what it looks like. So it covered everything from the high level, like what's the role of the robot? Is it a mini version of him? Was it its own person, so to say? Uh, where's the robot going? And then on the lower level, as I said, like the actions, what should the robot say, the input features and the interface itself. So we ended up with a system a bit like this. Um, so you had the robot next to the treadmill. In terms of input, we've got a heart rate sensor, a face camera, but we turned that off pretty quickly because the treadmill bounce was destroying the um, facial recognition. Uh, we have the speed of the treadmill, but we also had some things about the user, so their motivation and their personality uh, in, inside our input learning space. And this is kind of what they look like. So this is the, the um, interactive machine learning kind of in action, so to say. So at this point, uh, the robot has started learning and is now actually suggesting to the instructor, oh, I think it needs to be a pra praise action. And the instructor can click and say, yes, go ahead, do the praise action or can cancel it. So now you have another bit of learning feedback. Um, and some of the example dialogues, I'm not going to take credit for the, the, the jokes. Uh, the instructor wrote all of the jokes, uh, so don't blame me if they're bad. Um, but you can kind of get an idea of the different things the robot could do. And yeah, we put it in the gym. Uh, we put it in the gym for three months. Uh, 10 people signed up, only one dropped out over a period of, like I said, three months, 12 weeks. So we're pretty happy about that. We ran a total of 230 odd uh, robot led instructor supported sessions. So of those, about 150 we used to generate training data. So they were feeding data into the system. So that was where the instructor was sitting there telling the robot what to do, uh, responding to the robot suggestions. About 30 autonomous um, uh, sessions actually using that um, machine learning system. And then we also had some uh, control condition. So this was basically where we'd written <clears throat> the much more old school traditional AI, if this, then that type heuristics to control the robot. I'll skip past the results a little bit, but essentially, uh, maybe I can skip this one. What you can basically see here is that when we asked people uh, at the end of every session, how good was the session? The robot, when it was supervised, got basically the same scores as the robot when it was autonomous. So we would say our autonomous robot worked pretty well and it outperformed the traditional if this, then that uh, heuristics. So yes, it was a lot of effort uh, to do this kind of learning, but it really paid off in terms of the robot's performance. But more importantly, um, I said, you know, yeah, it's good autonomous behavior. It worked, right? We made the robot autonomous. People didn't really notice. Only two out of nine people noticed when we, we moved from fitness instructor controlled to autonomy. But what's really successful here is we saw some super nice uh, emergent synergies. So because we put it in the real world, uh, we saw things like the instructor started using the robot to autonomously do warm ups while he was still doing stretches with the, with the previous participant. That's something that we would not have seen in the lab. It's something that emerged uh, because we were in the real world. And I, when we actually asked participants uh, and the fitness instructor afterwards, you know, this whole process of working with the robot for three months, how did it feel? From the instructor's point of view, he really felt the robot was a colleague. It wasn't there to steal his job. It wasn't there to replace him. It was there to complement what he could do. And, and they together, they, he, he kind of perceived it as a colleague more than a tool because it was like this personality he designed. It was like a, a teammate. For the, uh, in, uh, for the exercising participants, they were like, yeah, you know, the robot was a nice gym buddy. I, I kind of, uh, you know, looked forward to see what the robot was going to say and that the robot was going to encourage me. But what's particularly nice is that um, the participants specifically spoke about both the robot and the instructor in complementary ways. So saying, you know, it was the combination of having the robot on the treadmill, but the instructor was still in the background that really made me want to stick to the stick to the program. And having the instructor in the background really, you know, eased their concerns or any any worries they had. Oh, can the robot tell if I'm working too hard? Of course, you know, having the instructor there kind of helped with that. And just to prove that it was indeed successful. So these are photos from the instructor's Instagram. Uh, so I have permission to, to, to share these. Um, but yeah, so, you know, he really had a great time doing this. I had a great time working with him. And I think it's very nice that it, it kind of worked both in the technical sense, but also in the social sense. Okay, that's it. That was a real uh, flyby, but uh, hopefully you have some interesting questions for me and I'm happy to discuss as you wish.
Thank you so much. I, uh, for myself at least, I think it's super uh, inspiring to see this kind of hands-on and concrete example. So where you actually can have a social robot overall. Uh, I actually got a little bit interested in uh, working out with a robot because that actually might make me go to the gym. <laughs> So thank you so much. We don't have any questions in the chat right now, but please, uh, if anyone have a question, just uh, reach out. We don't have that much time, but hopefully we can take a few at least. Uh, but I can start with one. Um, at least from my uh, point of view, I've seen this, like you, you met Pepper at, uh, it's kind of a known robot, and you met the Pepper at like a, like a fair or something. And uh, I'm just, um, wondering, can you tell us anything about like the speed of the development overall when it comes to show, social robotics and how fast it goes? Because I, I feel like it might be kind of it, maybe there's a threshold for people trying to open up uh, towards like a ERL robot. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a really good question. So um, the speed of the speed of development is very fast in terms of like uh, something like Pepper is great in that you know I as a kind of academic robotics researcher can go and buy Pepper and it already has lots of inbuilt functionality to uh, start kind of developing social behaviors quite quickly. So it's quick in that sense. However, it's much slower to um, actually build a robot from scratch. And so for, well, that's one of the reasons you see Pepper so often at um, a fair or something, because it's just so much easier to buy this ready-made platform. But because of that, I sometimes forget, I think as you're pointing out, I forget that for many people, they might not have met Pepper before, or they might have met Pepper in a completely different context. And then they're like, oh, so is your Pepper the same one that I saw in the fairground? Is your Pepper the same one I saw in the shop? And then that's a bit confusing because you know, when we think of humans, we know what those humans do and we know who they are, even if it's sometimes in different contexts, it's still like a bit strange to have this some sort of in real life character that can be in multiple places at once, but they're not all the same because the what really makes the robot the robot is probably more like the AI behind it. And then it, it can have this same, this same body. So yeah, people's reactions change the more that they, they work uh, with the robot, of course, because they get familiar with it. And there's a question of like, how soon does the novelty wear off and things like this. Um, so yeah, uh, development is fast and um, what we don't really understand yet, that longer term element, because most studies are, I mean, my study was three months, that's still way longer than most uh, such studies. So we don't really know how that's going to progress longer term, but I think, really clever social intelligence will be the key to you know getting past that novelty effect like you can say a joke with siri once or twice and then it's pretty old after that um, yeah great that's super interesting to see and hope that we might see more uh, upcoming months and years and uh, we have a question in the chat and it's more about the, the impact and which areas you would see that the, the social robots can actually make the most impact and maybe where the legal boundaries might uh, hinder the development or the implicate uh, or the, how to implicate them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so legal boundaries is very difficult, especially like, you know, all of the sort of GDPR stuff, all of the AI regulation that is kind of being talked about now would simply just uh, apply to robots as well. So we have the same challenges in this sense. Uh, I tend to be a bit um, avoidant and try to find myself nice economists to work with or lawyers to work with because it's 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 such a big uh, big ta problem to, ta to tackle. So I have to kind of defer to those on how to do the legal side. But in terms of applications, what we're already seeing is definitely education with young people, definitely in um, special needs care, whether that's with elderly or people who have very specific uh, needs, disabilities or things like this. Um, in my work I'm doing, as I said, was exercise motivation, but basically anywhere that you can think of where social interaction seems important and that we perhaps don't have as many humans to fill those gaps as we might like. So whether it's, you know, companionship to avoid loneliness, but really making sure, again, I should really stress, you know, it's never or it should never be about replacing the, hum the very, very important human-human interaction there, but just augmenting it. So if you've got a teacher with 20 children in front of them, 
if one or two of those children read a bit slower or then they struggle with their maths a bit more, maybe they can have some additional tutoring with the robots and one-on-one -on -one while the teacher deals with the rest of the class type thing. Uh, so I think those are the kind of applications that most people are sort of seeing for these robots. Great, and I have so many follow-up questions, but uh, time is running out. And I think that uh, Peter wants to wrap up the session before we say goodbye for today. But thank you so much, Katie, for uh, guest starring and uh, doing this amazing and interesting speech. So the floor is yours, oh, Peter. There I am. Yeah, thank you. And, and Katie, thank you so much. I, I know, I think you uh, are working together with Marika Jonsson also, right, for, for special needs. And, and that is some fantastic research that's going on um, at KTH in, in those sectors where, where it really is about the human and machine working together in different way, ways and, and augmenting each other and complementing each other. Um, once again, thank you so much all. Thank you, Katie. Uh, thank you, uh, all of you who have attended today. Um, the next time is already next week, as we said earlier. Uh, on the 8th of uh, December, we'll go deeper into machine learning and deep learning and more into the technical good stuff uh, here. Uh, also, you will get some, some insights into how to train a model. And then in the last session is on the 15th uh, of December, uh, where we'll have a panel to talk about the societal impact and the transformation with AI. Um, if you want to reach me, you can always reach me on, on uh, um, uh, LinkedIn or on Twitter. Uh, Paulinho, I'll get back to you. Uh, I'll promise I'll clean up my, my inbox in, in, on LinkedIn here. Uh, otherwise, uh, I hope you have a wonderful week, uh, a wonderful Wednesday and, and a wonderful rest of the week. So then we'll see you next week again in seven days. Take care. Thank you for the meeting. Thank you for the care. Yeah. Take care, everybody. Sure. Interesting. Bye. Thanks.